Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back once again, listeners. I always appreciate you giving us some, t- some of your time. With me today is a very special past guest, Dr. Christopher Howard. If you've been a longtime listener, you'll know that we did the Neuro Power Hour about quarterly in 2021, and he's back to talk with us about the extra um, African Americans are more at risk for Alzheimer's. So we're going to talk about a little bit about that, why that might be, and neuropsychology, which is what he is a doctor in, and a few other things he's got going. So thanks for coming back again, Chris. Absolutely. Thank you for having me back. Um, you know, it's always a pleasure, like just to, you know, just kind of return and, you know, chit chat and just kind of, you know, enlighten the masses about, you know, what's going on and what we can do and, uh, you know, just try to resolve the problem. I think this episode is going to be particularly special, just largely because um, usually we just speak broadly and we just try to raise awareness just in terms of statistics of like, you know, African-Americans, people being uh, afflicted with Alzheimer's, but this time um, we're also going to talk about a special event. So that way, uh, it's kind of like the best of the both worlds, where a specific community gets an opportunity to learn about Alzheimer's, but as well as uh, your general listeners. So I'm definitely excited about this. Well, I definitely think we need to educate the masses. Like our entire population needs to understand that cognitive impairment is not a normal part of aging. Alzheimer's, other dementias, not a normal part of aging. And what we, you know, what we need to do to prevent it as much as possible, what we need to understand about it. And that education should be able to enable people to help support those of us who are taking care of a loved one with Alzheimer's like I did or just an aging parent. Because our brains do slow down a little bit as we age, but not to the point that we can't remember what we had for breakfast or our kids' names. So (laughs) where would you like to start? (laughs) Um, wow, that's a really good question. Where would I like to start? Um, okay. So currently I'm in Chicago. I'm working at Thompson Membrane Attention. So this is a little bit different because now I'm doing more lifespan. Like before, um, you know, I feel like I've done the whole gauntlet of terms of neuro, like where I worked with individuals with the traumatic brain injuries, rehabilitation medicine. I worked with individuals who were grappling with substance abuse. And then I worked with individuals with serious mental illness. And so now I'm kind of back doing the lifespan, which is pretty cool. But you know what? One of the things I have is like a huge population of geriatrics. So it's just kind of interesting, right? Because like a lot of times when we talk about Alzheimer's, we just think about Alzheimer's, what it is. But like working with the geriatric individuals, it gives me an opportunity to kind of see other nuanced factors like does this individual have a partner? Uh, is this individual divor- divorced? How long has uh, it been going on? Re- resources are available and stuff. And when you do it like from that manner, one of the things that you realize is that Alzheimer's doesn't really just happen in a vacuum, but there is a really residual impact of how it impacts people, right? Mm-hmm. And how it impacts family members, caregivers, the changes that they need to make. Or sometimes you move away from Alzheimer's and you deal with cardiovascular dementia, which is unique because sometimes you just have like a specific area, like just specifically memory that's impacted, but almost other parts of their life just seem to be intact and stuff. And it's just like, okay, well, what do we do now? Because this is what the data is showing. This is what the background history has substantiated. Like, where do we go from here? So uh, um, I think, the long story short, I think it's really interesting. That's kind of like where I'm at right now. And um, it's just a fantastic opportunity just to work with all groups of people and just see the contextual factors. Um, yeah. So you're in Chicago or right outside Chicago? Are, yeah, I'm from the it, state. So I'm kind of uh, in the outskirts of Chicago. It's an industrial suburb. Okay. So are the um, most of your patients predominantly people of color? No, uh, they're predominantly white, but you do start to see a little bit more people of color, like uh, just the evolution of neuropsych, like maybe 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, like majority of the people who are utilizing neuropsychological services 
were white. But now, you know, you start to see more Hispanic individuals. Periodically, you still see African-American individuals. It's just kind of interesting because I don't think the field has progressed to the extent where they can say, you know what, let's do neuropsych in a community, right? And I always use this example, right? Like Chicago is 2.6 million people proper. And one third of Chicago's African-American, one third of Chicago's Hispanic, and the other third is white, give or take a little bit, right? But just approximately, like, and- Round, round numbers. <laughs> when, you, when you round the numbers, right? Um, and when you think about like how it works, um, African-Americans and Hispanics are disproportionately have an onset of Alzheimer's, but mm-hmm. you're not going to find a neuropsychologist in their community. Like it's just such a paucity of health resources, paucity of healthcare resources. And what ends up happening is that people have to travel like far and wide in order to receive adequate mental health. And when you think about Midwestern cities, like a lot of these cities have been plagued with the redlining. So just to put that in context, like during the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, it was called the Great Migration, where large groups of African-Americans left the American South and they headed to the Midwest, they headed to the East Coast, they headed to like the West Coast. This is why you have cities with Los Angeles that has like maybe 400,000 African-Americans. This is why there's such a large population of individuals in San Francisco, Oakland, who come from Texas, Louisiana. Like wherever the trains mm-hmm. led, this is where you see people. This is why in Chicago, like you have such a huge population of African-Americans from Mississippi and Arkansas, right? Like in Detroit, a lot of people come from Alabama and, you know, Philadelphia, New York City, people come from New York, or not New York, but North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, you know, places of those places, right? So this is why, you know, you have these huge populations where you wouldn't expect to find them. And so what they did was that they created certain sections of town where this is the African-American side. And during the African-American side, which and that was what was called red line, and the African-American side of town, usually there was just a lack of resources, lack of schooling, lack of mental, uh, mental health, healthcare resources, and everything of the sort. So you fast forward 60, 70 years, there's a residual impact because what we understand is that these African-Americans and Hispanics have such a high rate of disease and Alzheimer's and everything of the sort. And now they have to travel across town in order to get access to care. But because these cities have been redlined, it's no easy feat, right? Mm -hmm. Um, It's a little bit easier with the advent of Uber and Lyft and like some of the metro systems are a little bit better. But if you're really ingratiated into a side of town, it's hard to get there, right? You think about Chicago, like that is a city that's dependent on the transit system. Well, the city goes all the way to 109th Street, 112th Street, but the green line stops at 69th. The red line stops at 95th Street. And you still have like a significant part of the city that doesn't have access to care, right? Mm-hmm. So is this is why it's so important just to kind of raise awareness and like help people have access and know which questions to ask. That makes sense. So can you explain explain briefly what a neuropsychologist does? Because right. you explained so, it to me a long time ago, but I'm <laughs> I'm drawing a little bit of a blank today. <laughs> Right. So, so neuropsychology um, is you study like the brain behavior relationships, right? So brain behavior relationships could be anything, right? You could be looking at it from a standpoint of autism, or you could be looking at it from a standpoint of geriatric care, right? And the individual is mm-hmm. getting older and this individual is experiencing memory loss, right? Well, what is memory loss? Uh, memory memory is made of three things, right? Your ability to learn, which is encoding, storage, and retrieval. So it's kind of like if I have trouble learning something, then it's difficult to retrieve. It's difficult to store it, and retrieving becomes that much more complicated, right? But mm-hmm. the then you have to ask yourself, well, what is the genesis of the problem with encoding, right? Is it some sort of neural anatomical feat that's happening? Or am I just depressed, right? Because sometimes depressed can cosplay uh, a psychiatric disorder or depression can cosplay Alzheimer's or, or dementia or anything of the sort. So when you go to neuropsych testing, we're like, no, this is just depression. But when you have to do something and really use cognitive functioning, you're within the normal limits of your peers. Um, uh, and I don't think I finished my last point. So my last point is just like, there's not a lot of neuropsychologists in these communities largely due to redlining, largely due to underserved resources and stuff. And as a result, these people don't have access to neuropsychology. 
And what ends up happening is that they have these, these diseases and it just tends to proliferate. And that's why statistically African-Americans, um, they get diagnosed with Alzheimer's at such a later rate. And when you get diagnosed with the later rate, it's hard to do intervention and other programs and stuff because the disease has progressed so much. Which makes sense. Mm-hmm. So you think it's a chicken and an egg kind of situation, like less resources, less education so they don't know that there's these services they could take advantage of or the services aren't there just because of like redlining well you know what (laughs) you know it's no easy answer for a complex situation but i do agree to a certain extent right uh because representation matters uh just a little story like when i was living the first time i lived in chicago um I used to get my hair cut in the west side of the city. Um, and the west side of the city is majority African American. Um, Lake Street, Madison Avenue, um, you know, Chicago Ave. And I would have this neural nurse shirt. Like my school hated neural nurse. They hated the concept of going into the area, promoting neuropsych, and they're like, well, why do we want to go to West Side, South Side, Chicago? Why can't you go to North Side? Whatever the case may be. And when you would wear a shirt that said neural nerves or neuropsychology, wherever the case may be, people would be like, what is that compared to just your traditional psychology? Because psychology has done such a poor job of ingratiating with people of color, but also a lot of times with people of color, they've adopted this mindset where they don't necessarily believe in therapy. And it's getting better. I will say it's getting better and stuff like that because but there's this notion that we got to keep everything in house. Whatever happens in the household has to stay in the household because we don't have the privilege of being weak, particularly when we're the first uh, fired, the last hired, that sort of situation. So you got to keep everything in the house. And, you know, so it's always been this contiguous relationship between the mental health field and African-Americans when really it should have been a huge embrace. Um, but to your point, like, Sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And what ends up happening is that when people don't realize that neuropsychology exists, they don't really look to utilize it. When neuropsychology has done such an amazing job of gatekeeping the field and making sure people of color don't get in just by way of being expensive, by way of tests and multiple cutoffs and different things, what ends up happening is that you have these two entities that need each other, but that don't... uh, coalesce like they don't come together and stuff so you get people who struggle working with people of color you get people who can't go into west side chicago south side chicago west detroit east detroit hallville and indianapolis or any underserved communities and you just have this gap right but people need each other um because i'm being coming convoluted but what ends up happening is that People would trust me. They're like, okay, well, you get your hair cut over here. You go to gym over here. You grocery shop over here. So we trust you. So we're going to ask you questions that we may not ask other people and stuff. And one of the things that I found is that people do care about mental health. People do care about dementia. People want to know. People want the resources, right? But the resources aren't always available. And if the resources aren't available and we don't necessarily know what questions to ask, well, we could do bad all by ourselves, right? So a lot of times Mm -hmm. I just find myself the liaison between the mental health field, the neurosciences, and the African-American community. Um, And what you you see a lot of times is people say, well, uh, how do we engage these communities? How do we do this, whatever? And it's just like easy. Be present (laughs) and be consistent, right? Makes sense. And that's why you need people of color to engage these communities who want to be there. It's not like, okay, we'll do this event one day and we'll never be back. But no, we're consistently there. Um, yeah. So I, I I think I think the onus falls on both things, but I think it's incumbent on the mental health field, particularly the neuroscientists, to say, hey, we're going to make a a concerted effort to ingratiate these this community because this community is like the most largely affected. Makes sense. I also think when you're in a community different from your own, you need to listen. Fairly really right. simple, but, you know, I think one of the things people, you know, they're like, they're coming to this community or this group and they're wanting to, and it doesn't matter what kind of group, but they want to share some information and educate. And so you kind of come in with this, you know, almost like a chip on your shoulder, not intentionally all the time. Some people might do that, but it's like, I'm here to help them. And so you're not necessarily there to listen. And that's really super important. Right. It's one thing I've learned, you know, doing a podcast, you got to listen to a lot of stuff. So, yeah, well, you know, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. <clears throat> no, that's, no, go ahead. 
Yeah, I mean, the savior complex, like I call it the savior <laughs> complex, and it's such a unique thing where it, it's it's a relic of a belief system, right? Mm-hmm. Where even if you don't mean it intentionally, you believe that because these people are underserved or in need, that it's your responsibility to save them. And perhaps sometimes they don't need a savior, but they need an ally or they need somebody that can work alongside them and stuff. And I know that can be challenging to some groups of people because it's just like, how do I work with somebody who I feel should be indebted to my services? I remember I was trying to work on this project and I was telling like one of uh, one of my colleagues, whatever, because we were trying to see what's going to be more impactful, like neuropsych testing, reading ability, and a level of community in terms of like healthcare responses. And one of the things I was kind of telling because we were working, uh, the research participation group was like individuals from Chicago. And one of the things I was kind of saying is like, there's power in community because it's kind of like an aggregation of resources, right? Because like you may say reading, but if it's an older population and they escape Jim Crow South, then they might not have had a quality of education. So even if, even if like the pamphlets or healthcare resources are at a sixth grade or fifth grade reading level, there's a high probability that their educational system that they stem from wasn't equipped to give them that level of education, particularly if they were living in an era where it's just about, hey, you know what, I can make a good living working at a factory or at a plant or having such an industrial job, right? So, and also with neuropsych testing is so heavily influenced by verbal or ver- ver- vocabulary, verbal stuff that sometimes it creates these misnomers that like make people from an IQ standpoint, look a little bit lower than what they actually are. But I was like, there's power in community because what ends up happening is that people aggregate resources and this is how they know and this is how they do different things, right? This is what made the COVID intervention so successful is when people start engaging like the different churches, the community events, the fraternities, the sororities, where people had a opportunity to ask questions, get information in real time versus just like depending on a pamphlet or doing some sort of neuropsychological testing. So this is like the intricacies of like public health neuroscience or community neuropsych. That makes sense. And everybody learns differently too. I mean, I love to read and I'm very visual, but I don't always learn well by reading stuff. It kind of depends on the topic. Never learned math that way. I can tell you that. For <laughs> sure. Right. I didn't learn math by doing it either. So I don't know what that says about me, other than I'm an artist and I don't do math. So. <laughs> um, I think one of our other problems is in this country, we don't, we seem to be like a little bit terrified of aging. We very much shy away from um, acknowledging that the end of life is always death. And that's just normal. That's the circle of life, basically. It's mm-hmm. that is also changing. I don't know if that's just social media and people sharing more or the or COVID and probably both. But you know, there's only about thirty five hundred gerontologists, geriatricians mm-hmm. in this entire country, which, you know, I live in a state with forty million people. I would think thirty five hundred would barely cover what we need just for California. When you right. talk about what do we got, three hundred and thirty million in the whole country, that's just horrible. And they're the lowest paid specialty, right. which is just really stupid because we're all aging, you know? We either yeah. age or we die young, which nobody likes to die young. So, yeah, we need to we need a cultural shift in how we think about the the entire spectrum of our lives. We seem to kind of get hung up on the the adult period where we're raising families, hustling, working, making money, doing things. You know, that's fine. That's a very important part of our lifespan, but it's not the only part of our lifespan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think it's existentialism. I mean, like there's this 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 fear of death, this 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 fear of getting old and stuff, right? Because everybody sees like the war stories, right? Like everybody sees like visiting, like maybe when you're like I remember when I was younger, like my grandma like I would spend like maybe two weeks with her during the summer and stuff. And she would like visit the sick and the shut in as part of her church. Uh, she was part of like the Tolson society, which I, which I'm assuming is like some that's part of the Catholic church. But anyway, and you would see her friends and different other people. And like, you know, they maybe have dementia, maybe have Alzheimer's, maybe like lost a limb due to diabetes or whatever the case may be. And it was like really, really frightening and stuff, right? Because like when you watch TV, you see these things where people gracefully get older and that's life that everybody wants. 
But sometimes it's just about the preparation of just getting old. Like it doesn't have to be like this fairy tale, but it doesn't also have to be doom and gloom. But it's like the preparation that you have leading into older age that kind of dictates like the quality of life that you have. And not only just the quality of life that you have, but the quality of life that others around you experience. Because one of the things that we know just about caregiving is that it doesn't just affect like the person who's getting older or the person that, um, you know, has developed dementia or some sort of ailment. But what ends up happening is like if you're a caregiver and things haven't been prepared pro properly, then as a caregiver, now you're isolated from monetary resources, social resources, spiritual resources, everything of the sort. And next thing you know that it's so easy for you to develop your own pathology because now you're stressed. And we understand what stress does to the body, right? Yeah. And but it, 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 and it's about having honest conversations, right? And this is kind of like what I tell my patients also. It's like, it's not about like, if you love somebody, you're able to do the possible or the impossible for them, right? Because you know what? No matter how much you try or you want to, not everybody's equipped to give mom or dad a bath, right? Yep. Not everybody's equipped to feed mom or dad or sometimes mom or dad or the loved one or whomever, like, you know, they might develop Louis bodies or they might, you know, so they start wandering, wandering around the house through the night or something like that. Right. Or, you know, maybe they develop some progressive aphasia and they say something mean or nasty or whatever, and it hurts your feelings. And now you just haul off and hit them or whatever, you know, into and now you're in trouble for elder abuse. Like these are yep. things that really do happen. So it's about having honest conversations about your what you're willing to do, what you can do. How do we have rotations? Who can watch mom or dad or whenever for this specific period of time? Or we don't want to give up the house, but she can't live in this house anymore. Do we want to do assisted living care, right? With people who are equipped to do these things, right? These are honest conversations that are very, very hard because what it does is that it disrupts the reality or sometimes disrupts the fantasy of the way that we wanted to live life, right? Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. The best advice that I got recently is to ask your aging loved ones, and this applies to those of us that are also aging. As you know, my paternal grandmother lived to 103, so that's my goal. So 47 more years to go is a long time. and But we've had these conversations, but to basically say mom, dad, whatever, auntie, like my uncle is my dad's, my dad was the oldest of three, so the middle brother is not healthy. Um, his daughters live in different states than they do. Um, <clears throat> and so this is a good conversation that maybe I should have with them. I'll have to think on that one. But it's to basically say, how do you want to live out the rest, you know, the rest of your retirement years? Because you know what you're going to hear. Well, I want to live forever in my house. Okay, great. I get that. It's paid for. You know, there's some benefits. However, like my house, my office is downstairs. And it's cold downstairs. <laughs> Even in the summer, it's cold. And, you know, it's stairs. I got some crappy knees. You know, I'm not so sure stairs is a good thing for my future. But it's also, you know, cooking, cleaning, yard maintenance. You know, we're like a mile from the grocery store. I'm not going to walk. I mean, I can walk there, but I don't want to walk back up the hill carrying groceries. So what is realistic about, quote, living forever in my home? 
You know, what can we do to make that happen? And if that's not possible, then what? And that's the, that's where most people don't go. And most, a lot of people, you know, mom says, well, I want to live in my home forever. Okay, mom, I'll never put you in a memory care or assisted living. And my listeners know, don't ever promise that because the guilt that will kill you when you have to break that promise is just, it's horrific. I never promised my mom that. And I felt horrific moving her to memory care. And it was the best thing for all of us because she had friends. She got into mischief with these friends. You know, she had an outlet there that she would not have had if she had lived with me. And that was not a scenario that I knew would work because she and I weren't going to work together very well. (laughs) And there's just, you know, you got to, you got to think about, we plan, you know, we're in high school. We plan for what we're going to do after high school. We're going to go to college, community college. We're going to go to trade school. We're just going to jump right into the work world. You know, we, we plan our adult life. We get to retire and we plan our retirement and then we stop planning. And, you know, if I'm going to live to 103, there's a lot of retirement years that I need to plan. Correct. Um, I think, and this is why, you know, we're, we're going to do this event. But before I even get to that, like, um, you know, it really does take planning. Um, because I've seen a couple of people, right? And they're very, very fearful that maybe they have, like, this onset. And, you know, what? maybe they still live in a city and all the loved ones are gone. Like all the loved ones live across the country and it's not feasible for those loved ones to either have you move in with them because we've heard, I've heard the war stories about like, you know, a loved one moves in and they live a little bit longer than anticipated. And I'm not trying to be doom and gloom or anything like that, but these are real life scenarios. And because they live longer, like, okay, cool. Like you're around us or whatever the case may be, but it's not like a healthy live longer. And now you drain the family's resources. And now that family who took you in, like now their 401k is gone or their life savings is gone. And other family members who are supposed to help or assist, they didn't help or assist like they should, or that they promised that they would. And now you're like almost in destitution and the other family's like, oh, well, you know, we'll pray for you or we'll hope things get better. <laughs> and it's not right. Like right. these are the schisms that happen. Um, so it, it's honest conversations. And, you know, I, I sometimes like, you know, and of course I'm going to say this because I'm, I'm a neuropsychologist, but therapy too, right? Like, what are you going as a family? Like, what are you doing or undergoing and stuff right there to work out the conflict, right? To create an open line of communication. Um, because as much as we like to think that we can move somebody in or, or sometimes it's hard because you don't know when somebody's going to get sick or whatever the case may be. You can't stop the middle of your career and move from Portland, Oregon, back to Chicago and try to find a job and resources, apartment, home or whatever the case may be to accommodate this one loved one. And that that loved one doesn't want to move to Portland. (laughs) Correct. Even though that might be the best solution. (laughs) It's yeah, this is where conversations and, you know, really thinking about it, like how when we bought this house. okay, so when we bought this house, we wanted four bedrooms, one floor. Not a golf course, not a gated community. <laughs> Christopher's been here, so he knows. Yeah, there's a two story house. Sure. Most of everything's on the main floor, but we're on a golf course. We're in a gated community. We got a homeowner's. Well, all the things we said we didn't want, that's what we ended up with. Um, and there's reasons for that. It's not like we caved and gave up, but um, we live on a lake too, which is fun. But we knew, like, this is our last home unless we move to assisted living. And it took a while to convince the hubby that we need to think about that. But it's like, you know, you know, because you have your own place, like, you know, the cooking, the cleaning, the, you know, just simple maintenance for one person is a lot. You, you get burned out because you're busy at work. You want to go to the gym. You want to, you want to have that soft life you've been talking about on Twitter. Oh yeah. Soft and, (laughs) what is it? Soft Soft black man man life. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) I had to, I had to figure out what that acronym, that hashtag was. I'm like, what is this hashtag? Oh, that's why I don't know what that hashtag is. I don't have, (laughs) I have a soft life, but not black man. So <laughs> I only got one third of those. But, you know, how do you like, that's how you almost need to think about like, okay, when I'm 90, do I want to have to be worried about breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Do I want to worry about getting groceries in the house, whether they're delivered or, you know, I'm going out and, you know, how am I going to get back and forth to the doctor? I've got really wacko vision. I cannot stand driving in the dark. Makes me a nervous wreck. Probably not the best idea. So I avoid it as much as possible, especially since we've moved, because it's not it's not back of the hand familiar like the county I lived in for 55 years. 
you know, these are all things we need to think about. Like I bought my car in September of 2016 and the way I drive, it's got zero, like no miles on it. So I may have it till the, you know, till I'm not capable of driving anymore. And I realize that might happen sooner rather than later for me, just because I've got weird vision. I have no depth perception, so it does make driving a little interesting, but that's how it's been my whole life. So, you know, this, these are the things we need to contemplate. Okay, well, if I can't drive, then what? You know, it's going to be a little tricky to get to the grocery store unless I get the street legal golf cart, which may not be any safer than a car. I don't know. But it's like we need to think about these things. Like, I would like to enjoy my like the last, you know, 15 years of my life. I don't want it to be hard. And people avoid that. I guess we just kind of figure it'll all be fine. We're very positive right. in that the end of our life will be a fairy tale, even though probably the rest of our life was not. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, I mean, I know it's all a good point. So this is why I want to host this luncheon. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about the luncheon and stuff, right? Uh, Sounds good. So um, what I'm aiming to do July 19th, July 19th, is I want to host a luncheon with the AME Zion District of Detroit, Michigan. Um, one of my cousins, he's the presiding elder, Ron Lee Bailey. And so one of the things, kind of like everything that we talked about thus far, is you want to raise awareness, right? Detroit, Detroit, Michigan is among the blackest cities in America. And I'm not like trying to be like this black liberalist or black <laughs> nationalist or anything like that. But one of the things I want to do is like really raise awareness. And the city's 80% African-American, 639,000 people, which equivalents to almost like maybe 475,000. Somebody check the math. But essentially what I want to do <laughs> is that I know Michigan is having an aging crisis. I understand that kind of like Chicago, you're not going to find a neuropsychologist in the city of Detroit that's going to be in the community. Like you'll find a couple like that are downtown, but with a city that's so big, like it's not enough people to engage that community, particularly when you think about like the affliction that comes with Alzheimer's and African-Americans, like the statistics is that African-Americans, we develop Alzheimer's at a rate that's three to four times higher than the white individuals. It's a different genetic component. Uh, we get diagnosed later, which means that it usually tends to be more aggressive. And a lot of our stuff comes from like stress or in the perception of um discrimination, that sort of thing. So it's like when you have a huge population that's afflicted with this, it becomes a quiet epidemic and it's incumbent on us, the field, to solve it. Um, and sometimes when you kind of address this, like you become a heretic and that's fine. But one of the things I want to do is use the summertime to answer questions, get resources to the community, and we can take a couple of steps towards resolving this problem. Um, so yeah, so um, we're aiming for July 19th, Alzheimer's Luncheon. It's going to be affiliated with the AME Zion District of Detroit, Michigan. That sounds awesome. And like we were talking about earlier, we definitely need education. And I know from my not so worldly perspective is the way society portrays black women is just mm -hmm. being really strong and just they could just take take it. Yeah, I guess you have to, but. You know, yeah. that's that's you know, not so, a positive. That's not a positive way to approach. It's you know, not the, your and, community. And I'll tell you why. Uh, so recently, I was published um, for this paper, peer review, International Journal. Um, just to my horn a little bit, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, what we found is that we were looking at John Henryism, and so what John Henryism is this perception of if something's challenging, if I work hard enough, then I can beat the odds, right? And what ends up happening is that individuals who ascribe to the John Henry principle, uh, it was highly correlated with cognitive dysfunction. But when it was stratified by gender, it was only African-American women, women who were impacted by John Henryism. So even African-American men who ascribe to John Henryism, they weren't impacted, but it was African-American women, you know. And when you talk to African-American women from all facets of life, um, it's John Henry mantra persists. Like when I speak to my mom, some of her friends, um, 
I jokingly recognize it as, you know, a professional woman PTSD because she talks about the battles that she endured working for a profession like a, a Fortune 500 company doing HR. HR in of itself is challenging, but she was just like, I was a dark skinned African American woman educated from Detroit, Michigan. Before I could walk in the door good, they made it blatantly obvious that they didn't want me there. Right. So it's the job that you got to do, but it's also the politics that you have to navigate. But it's a number of women that kind of also, uh, as they're trying to launch their careers, endure like this level of stress and PTSD. So one of the things that we know about stress is that it changes the neural anatomy. Right. Like so mm -hmm. when individuals who undergo a lot of stress, what it does is that. You know, it short circuits the frontal cortex. Frontal cortex is the way that we make decisions, the way that we think. It also short, short circuits the hippocampi. Hippocampi is where we keep our memory at, right? So what is dementia, right? It's, you know, the uh, precipitous drop of memory. I mean, granted, it's a little bit more challenging than that. But when you look at these two areas of the brain that are most susceptible to the effects of cortisol, which is a residual impact of stress, then you understand why it's such a significant higher rate of uh, dementia in our community, but also it's also genetic component. Um, so white individuals, they develop Alzheimer's off apiloprotein under Lil4, right? But because African-Americans, Hispanics, we come from usually a tropical environment, historically, like the reason why we get sickle cell is the reason why apiloprotein, Lil4, ApoE4, doesn't necessarily affect us. What affects us is ABCA7. ABCA7 is phagocytosis, or in other words, it's part of like the immune defense. So when people are under chronic stress, what ends up happening is that the body becomes immunosuppressant. When the body becomes immunosuppressant, then it stops fighting diseases, right? Because it's thinking like, why should I like fight cancer or whatever the case may be when the threat's going to like just disappear and we can get back to normal because their body's always just trying to utilize and preserve resources. So what ends up happening under stress is like the body becomes immunosuppressant and it doesn't clear out the gunk in the brain. So it just, um, it just uh, increases. It just uh, gets worse and different things of the sort. And this is when you start seeing Alzheimer's, this is when we start seeing dementia. Uh, Dr. Lisa Barnes, credible neuropsychologist in Chicago, cognitive uh, neuropsychologist, she she came out with this article that, that I hold near and dear, and 75% of African-Americans that develop uh, dementia, um, it's a mixed pathology, right? So it could be Lewy bodies, it could be your traditional, it could be cardiovascular, right? Whereas only 50% of white individuals develop Alzheimer's. So you see like the significant discrepancy and everything kind of centers on the ability to disabuse stress or chronic stress rather, right? So this is what we're doing with this event is saying like, hey, what can we do to minimize the amount of chronic stress that you have in your life, right? <laughs> like if you're on a sinking ship, what's the first thing that you do? You throw away things that don't matter to you, right? So this is a sinking ship. And if chronic stress is a part of the culprit, right? what can you throw away that's going to alleviate the stress in your life, right? Because when you hold on to stress, what ends up happening, it also impacts other areas, right? You have less dopamine. And as a result, you know, there's a higher susceptibility to substance abuse because your brain is just like, hey, I got to get something that's going to make me feel good again. Okay, let me get liquor, or cigarettes, weed, whatever the case may be, right? Like, this is why, like, when people are stressed, they have a higher susceptibility to drug use, which turns in, which can turn into addictions and substance abuse. Um, so these are, these are the things that we want to approach. These are things that we want to discuss, right? Um, we want to get people resources available. Like we want to get University of Michigan there. We want to get Wayne State there. It's a number of rehabilitation places. We want to get there because education is one of the key factors, right? But we want to put education in a way so that it's easily digestible. We don't want to just give you a pamphlet and say, hey, good luck. No, if you have questions, this is why I did the two advanced practicums at Emory Department of Rehabilitation. This is why I did two po or two years of postdoc. This is why I've done all the community outreach. So for this very moment right here, if you have questions, I'm not running away. I'm not shying away. Like, no, we're going to address these questions so that we can affect the, the quality of life that you may have, right? So this is what we're working towards because just being in Chicago, like the first go around and being so involved in the community, people have questions, but they don't know where to go, right? Yeah. Not many neuropsychologists are going to come to come to underserved areas, particularly like in Detroit, but I'm going to be there 
Um, and what we're going to do is that we're going to address this problem. Somebody's going to start, right? Right. Um, but, you know, I sit on the shoulders of giants. Uh, Dr. Lisa Barnes, Dr. Jennifer Manley, Dr. Monica Parker, Dr. Goldie Bird in North Carolina. Like these women have done amazing, incredible things just in terms of Alzheimer's research in the African-American community. But, you know, I'm just clinical, which means that um, not only do I do research, but I do clinical applications. So I do the testing. So not only do I do the research, the thinking, the theory, but I also apply the application. So, you know, I'm just kind of sitting on their shoulders and I want to take that step forward. I want to say, all right, I could go in these communities. I can work. I'm not afraid of the hood, right? <laughs> I'm not afraid of the community. And so those are, those are the things that I'm really looking forward to just addressing, just accomplishing. That's wonderful. And I've always said, I said a lot on this show, I don't think modern life is good for our brains. One of which is because we are, we seem to be way more stressed than I'm assuming our ancestors were, which is almost hard to wrap my head around. Cause like if you were a farmer in the plains, you know, in the 1800s or, you know, a gold miner up here, you know, California, um, that's not easy work. And, you know, you didn't know for sure if you were going to have a good crop and be able to feed your family or find enough gold to make it worth digging in the streams or any of that stuff. But I just, I think modern life is really not good for our brains. You know, we're stressed. There's more air pollution. We have crappy food, more noise pollution. Just like, we just really need to, we need to figure out, like you said, what are you going to throw off the sinking ship to, to improve your life? And I hope that I hope that's something that people really think about because, you know, there's just there's only so much you can do. And you got I think you gotta be really particularly choosy so that you can live well for as long as you know, till a hundred and three, like I plan on doing. Absolutely. <laughs> so say like once again where where and when and I'll make sure it's in the show notes and I will okay. also throw out some social media for you. When oh, this comes out. It. So, yeah, because I know you're busy. So, and I do social oh, media man. all the time. <laughs> so. All right. So, we're aiming for July 19th. You know what? We're going to do July 19th. Uh, this is going to be an all summer's luncheon with the AME Zion District in Detroit, Michigan. Um, we haven't developed a venue yet, but I mean, hopefully, we find a venue within the next you know month or so. Uh, I mean, my cousin, um, you know, he's one of the presiding elders, which really helps out a lot because it just kind of give gives us an opportunity to really ingratiate ourselves in the community and just kind of really promote mental health awareness, particularly with a focus on dementia. Um, so yeah, so, so I'm really looking forward to it. Um, it's just an Alzheimer's luncheon. I'm sure I'll come up with a more creative name later, but you know what? Um, I'm really looking forward to this event. Awesome. Well, I will do whatever I can to help you because, like I said, I really feel like we need to educate the masses just so that there's more support, more understanding. You know, I've I've made it a I've said this a lot. I think I say it more on social media than on the show, but caregivers are not going to get more help until corporations realize that it currently is already affecting their bottom line and it's just going to get worse. So we might as well start educating everybody. So hopefully we can get more support because, you know, it's unrealistic to expect the government to take over all of the care that the 53 million plus family caregivers donate so wonderfully in this country. My Correct. mind, have you been, you know, it's like, it's a big dollar number and we know the government doesn't like to do stuff like that. So it's upon <laughs> us to help educate our entire communities so that, you know, like when Absolutely. I had my mom, I had my mom out at the library and she made a really off the wall comment to, there was two uh, women outside. Um, they were promoting their church and they were, um, I guess, Muslim. And my mom, I don't remember what she said. It wasn't anything derogatory. It was just completely out of context. And the younger of the two women was like, huh? she just looked at me like very baffled and a little unnerved. And so thankfully my mom was enough in front of me that I could say that she had Alzheimer's, which helped. Because then this gal understood, at least I hope she understood. But that's what we need. It's like, if you haven't been affected by a form of dementia in your family, which I have multiple times, then you don't know what to do. And it's a little scary. Or even dealing with somebody with autism, you're like, I don't know how to deal with them. And you know, you're kind of nervous and that makes them nervous. And so we just, 
We just need a lot of education and a lot of talks like this one. So I hope I can help spread the word on the luncheon. Yeah, no, I I definitely appreciate it. I think, uh, you know, thus far I've been like really, really fortunate because like we did an Alzheimer's luncheon in Chicago. Like that was like the first one I ever did. And like the community really came out, community really supported. Then we did one in the East Atlanta and we really got the numbers out there, um, which was really, really cool because it just kind of goes to show that people are interested in this topic. Like, you know, uh, matter of fact, just an interesting story. We took a page out of uh, the SCLC, uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, like what Martin Luther King was doing. So one of the things that we did was like we canvassed like the neighborhood that was like, um, you know, surrounding the church and whatever. And we passed out like, you know, just uh, little uh, little like flyers just to kind of promote the event, like with just like little information and stuff. And, you know, people like invite us into our homes and like they would just kind of talk about like, hey, you know what? We might not be able to make it. We have this, this, this lineup. But can you give us just a little spill about what's going to happen and stuff? And do you have any contact numbers? It was the same thing in West Side Chicago. Like we were out there and, you know, we we're just trying to hit like a lot of black churches in the area. And, you know, people were just like, Hey, we're not, we might not be able to make it, da, 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 but can you, you know, give us a spiel and we would be in a church basement impromptu just talking about Alzheimer's and answering questions and people would be engaged and they would have like little food that they would give us, you know, we'd have the food. So that to say is like, you start to recognize that there's this pattern that people want to know more, but they don't have the research or really where, know, know where to begin. So what we want to do is like, we want to give you a vehicle. We want to be a kind of do a conduit between the field and the community and say, yo, if you got questions, whatever it is, like we're going to answer it and we're going to do a question and answer panel, right? So whatever questions that you have about it, we're, we're, I am, because I'm going to answer it, you know, and we're going to do it in real time because Dr. Stringer is one of the most prolific neuropsychologists and he's from Detroit, but he just retired at Emory and stuff. And Dr. Shaw is one of the most prolific research scientists, and they were both on my dissertation committee. And if I can stand up in front of those two individuals and answer questions about uh, dementia and African-Americans, then I know I could do it anywhere. And one of the things that we're going to do is that we're going to do it in Detroit, Michigan, the Motor City. And we're going to take a step towards resolving this Alzheimer's dementia pandemic. And that's that's what I'm aiming to do. Well, that's awesome, and I will continue to do whatever I can to help. Well, thank I you really, so much. I really appreciate welcome. it. You're welcome. I appreciate you coming on today. And if anybody has any questions, you can find Christopher on Twitter. And I think Twitter is the best social media place for – I'll link that Absolutely. in the show notes in case anybody wants to find you. And I follow a lot of people, like I follow Dr. Lisa Barnes and stuff on Twitter. And if you guys ever want tweets that you don't understand <laughs> – <laughs> Yeah, follow the uh, black in is it Jiro science? There's a hashtag. Uh, yeah, black in uh, black in neuropsychology. Is it black in uh, black in neuroscience? I think. Yeah. B-I-N. Yeah. yeah I mean, if you I've, Google like black in neuroscience, you'll find them. Uh, amazing group. A lot of young individuals who are getting ready to you know approach the field of neuroscience from different all walks of life and stuff. So definitely uh, follow black in neuropsychology. I want to say it's black in neuropsychology, uh, but you can Google it and they'll direct you to the right way because, you know, it gives you an opportunity to kind of see the direction of the field, where it's headed, phenomenal group, phenomenal organization, really good information. You can even YouTube them too. No, that makes sense. I'm, I'm still of an age where I have YouTube a lot, a lot more stuff these days, but not usually medical stuff. So that's good information. And all of that will be linked in the episode notes and watch my social media for more on this luncheon, because like I said, education is extremely important. Um, if we want to get support as caregivers, then then we're going to have to do a little extra work and get the word out there to everybody. So that's what I'm trying to do. Absolutely. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.